Good morning, folks. It is day two of Star Wars Celebration 2023. Uh, as you probably know, I've been in mourning for the last few days after the disastrous uh, episode six of Mandalorian season three, and now seeing the announcements that have been made at Star Wars Celebration. I don't know if there's going to be any kind of appetite for what I'm doing here. Um, I, I hadn't really put a lot of thought into this, but I did think that maybe it might be fun to actually go to what I would consider the actual Episode 7 of Star Wars. It's what Lucasfilm probably should have attempted to adapt in the first place. Um, so I'm just going to read the first chapter of The Real Heir to the Empire. Uh, if this is something you like, let me know. I'm probably not really going to try and do voices here because I'm not really good at them. But um, let me know what you think. I just thought this might be something fun to do. Anyway, starting off. Chapter 1. Captain Pellian, a voice called down the portside crew pit through the hum of background conversation. Message from the sentry line. The scout ships have just come out of light speed. Pellian, leaning over the shoulder of the man at the Chimera's bridge engineering monitor, ignored the shout. Trace this line for me, he ordered, tapping a light pen on the in uh, schematic on the display. The engineer threw a questioning glance up at him. Sir? I heard him, Pellion said. You have an order, Lieutenant. Yes, sir, the other said carefully, and keyed for the trace. Captain Pellion, the voice repeated, closer this time. Keeping his eyes on the engineering display, Pellion waited until he could hear the sound of the approaching footsteps. Then, with all the regal weight that fifty years spent in the Imperial fleet gave to a man, he straightened up and turned. The young duty officer's brisk walk faltered, came to an abrupt halt. Uh, sir. He looked into Pellian's eyes and his voice faded away. Pellian let the silence hang in the air for a handful of heartbeats, long enough for those nearest to notice. This is not a cattle market in Sham He, Lieutenant Shell, he said at last, keeping his voice calm but icy cold. This is the bridge of an Imperial Star Destroyer. Routine information is not, repeat, not, simply shouted in the general direction of its intended recipient. Is that clear? Shell swallowed. Yes, sir. Elian held his eyes a few seconds longer, then lowered his head in a slight nod. Now, report. Yes, sir. Shell swallowed again. We've just received word from the sentry ship, sir. The scouts have returned from their scan raids on the Abroa Sky system. Very good, Pellian nodded. Did they have any trouble? Only a little, sir. The natives apparently took exception to them pulling a dump of their central library system. The wing commander said there was some attempt at pursuit, but that he lost them. I hope so, Pellian said grimly. Abroa Sky held a strategic position in the borderland regions, and intelligence reports indicated that the New Republic was making a strong bid for its membership and support. If they'd had armed emissary ships there at the time of the raid, well, he'd know soon enough. Have the wing commander report to the bridge ready room with his report as soon as the ships are aboard, he told Shell. And have the sentry line go to yellow alert. Dismissed. Yes, sir. Spinning around with a reasonably good imitation of a proper military turn, the lieutenant headed back towards the communications console. The young lieutenant. Which was, Pellian thought, with a trace of old bitterness, where the problem really lay. In the old days, at the height of the Empire's power, it would have been inconceivable for a man as young as Shell to serve as a bridge officer aboard a ship like the Chimera. Now, he looked down at the equally young man at the engineering monitor. Now, in contrast, the Chimera had virtually no one aboard except young men and women. Slowly, Pellian let his eyes sweep across the bridge, feeling the echoes of old anger and hatred twist through his stomach. There had been many commanders in the fleet, he knew, who had seen the Emperor's original Death Star as a blatant attempt to bring the Empire's vast military power more tightly under his direct control, just as he'd already done with the Empire's political power. The fact that he'd ignored the battle station's proven vulnerability and gone ahead with a second Death Star had merely reinforced that suspicion. There would have been few in the fleet's upper echelons who would have genuinely mourned its loss. If it hadn't, in its death throes, taken the Super Star Destroyer Executor with it. 
Even after five years, Pelion couldn't help but wince at the memory of that image. The executor, out of control, colliding with the unfinished Death Star, and then disintegrating completely in the battle station's massive explosion. The loss of the ship itself had been bad enough, but the fact that it was the executor had made it far worse. That particular Super Star Destroyer had been Darth Vader's personal ship, and despite the Dark Lord's legendary and often lethal capriciousness, serving aboard it had long been perceived as the quick line to promotion, which meant that when the executor died, so also did a disproportionate fraction of the best young and mid-level officers and crewers. The fleet had never recovered from that fiasco. With the executor's leadership gone, the battle had quickly turned into a confused rout, with several other Star Destroyers being lost before the order to withdraw had finally been given. Hellion himself taking command when the Chimera's former captain was killed, had done what he could to hold things together. But despite his best efforts, they had never regained the initiative against the rebels. Instead, they had been steadily pushed back, until they were here. Here in what had once been the backwater of the Empire, with barely a quarter of its former systems still under nominal Imperial control, here, aboard a Star Destroyer manned almost entirely by painstakingly trained but badly inexperienced young people, many of them conscripted from their homeworlds by force or threat of force. Here, under the command of possibly the greatest military mind the Empire had ever seen, Pelion smiled, a tight, wolfish smile, as he again looked around his bridge. No, the end of the Empire was not yet as the arrogantly self-proclaimed New Republic would soon discover. He glanced at his watch. 2.15. Grand Admiral Thrawn would be meditating in his command room now, and if Imperial procedure frowned on shouting across the bridge, it frowned even harder on interrupting a Grand Admiral's meditation by intercom. One spoke to him in person, or one did not speak to him at all. Continue tracing those lines, Pelion ordered the engineering lieutenant as he headed for the door. I'll be back shortly. The Grand Admiral's new command room was two levels below the bridge, in a space that had once housed the former commander's luxury entertainment suite. When Pelion had found Thrawn, or rather when the Grand Admiral had found him, one of his first acts had been to take over the suite and convert it into what was essentially a secondary bridge. A secondary bridge, meditation room, and perhaps more. It was no secret aboard the Chimera that since the recent refitting had been completed, the Grand Admiral had been spending a great deal of his time here. What was secret was what exactly he did during those long hours. Stepping to the door, Pelion straightened his tunic and braced himself. Perhaps he was about to find out. Captain Pelion to see Grand Admiral Thrawn, he announced. I have information... The door slid open before he'd finished speaking. Mentally preparing himself, Pelion stepped into the dimly lit entry room. He glanced around, saw nothing of interest, and started for the door to the main chamber five paces ahead. A touch of air on the back of his neck was his only warning. Captain Pelion, a deep, gravelly, cat-like voice mewed into his ear. Pelion jumped and spun around, cursing both himself and the short, wiry creature standing less than half a meter away. Blast it, Rook, he snarled. What do you think you're doing? For a long moment, Rook just looked up at him, and Pelion felt a drop of sweat trickle down his back. With his dark, large eyes, protruding jaw, and glistening needle teeth, Rook was even more of a nightmare in the dimness than he was in normal lighting. Especially to someone like Pelion, who knew what Thrawn used Rook and his fellow Nogri for. I'm doing my job, Rook said at last. He stretched his thin arm almost casually out towards the inner door, and Pelion caught just a glimpse of the slender assassin's knife before it vanished somehow into the Nogri's sleeve. His hand closed, then opened again, steel wire muscles moving visibly beneath his dark gray skin. You may enter. Thank you, Pelion growled. Straightening his tunic again, he turned back to the door. It opened at his approach, and he stepped through into a softly lit art museum. He stopped short, just inside the door, and looked around in astonishment. 
The walls and domed ceiling were covered with flat paintings and planics, a few of them vaguely human-looking, but most of distinctly alien origin. Various sculptures were scattered around, some freestanding, others on pedestals. In the center of the room was a double circle of repeater displays, the outer ring slightly higher than the inner ring. Both sets of displays, at least from what little Pelion could see, also seemed to be devoted to pictures of artwork. And in the center of the double circle, seated in a duplicate of the Admiral's chair on the bridge, was Grand Admiral Thrawn. He sat motionlessly, his shimmery blue-black hair glinting, glinting in the dim light, his pale blue skin looking cool and subdued and very alien on his otherwise human frame. His eyes were nearly closed as he leaned back against the headrest, only a glint of red showing between the lids. Helion licked his lips, suddenly unsure of the wisdom of having invaded Thrawn's sanctum like this. If the Grand Admiral decided to be annoyed... Come in, Captain, Thrawn said, his quietly modulated voice cutting through Pelion's thoughts. Eyes still closed to slits, he waved a hand in a small and precisely measured motion. What do you think? It's... very interesting, sir, was all Pelion could come up with as he walked to the outer display circle. All holographic, of course, Thrawn said and Pelion thought he could hear a note of regret in the other's voice. The sculptures and flats both. Some of them are lost. Many of the others are on planets now occupied by the Rebellion. Yes, sir, Pelion nodded. I thought you'd want to know, Admiral, that the scouts have returned from the Abroa Sky System. The Wing Commander will be ready for debriefing in a few minutes. Tron nodded. Were they able to tap into the Central Library System? They got at least a partial dump, Pelion told him. I don't know yet if they were able to complete it. Apparently there was some attempted pursuit. The wing commander thinks he lost them, though. For a moment, Thrawn was silent. No, he said. No, I don't believe he has. Particularly not if the pursuers were from the rebellion. Taking a deep breath, he straightened in his chair and, for the first time since Pelion had entered, opened his glowing red eyes. Pelion returned the other's gaze without flinching, feeling a small flicker of pride at the achievement. Many of the Emperor's top commanders and courtiers had never learned to feel comfortable with those eyes, or with Thrawn himself, for that matter, which was probably why the Grand Admiral had spent so much of his career out in the unknown regions, working to bring those still barbaric sections of the galaxy under Imperial control. His brilliant successes had won him the title of Warlord, and the right to wear the white uniform of Grand Admiral, the only non-human ever granted that honor by the Emperor. Ironically, it had also made him all the more indispensable to the frontier campaigns. Pelion had often wondered how the Battle of Endor would have ended if Thrawn, not Vader, had been commanding the Executor. Yes, sir, he said. I've ordered the sentry line onto yellow alert. Shall we go to red? Not yet, Thrawn said. We should still have a few minutes. Tell me, Captain, do you know anything about art? Uh, not very much, Pelion managed, thrown a little by the sudden change of subject. I've never really had much time to devote to it. You should make the time. Thrawn gestured to a part of the inner display circle to his right. Sapha paintings, he identified them. Circa 1550 to 2200, pre-Empire date. Note how the style changes, right here, at the first contact with the Thinquora. Over there, he pointed to the left-hand wall, are examples of Paeonid Extrasa art. Note the similarities with the early Sapha work, and also the mid-18th century Priam Vac Threest flat sculpt. Yes, I see, Pelion said, not entirely truthfully. Admiral, shouldn't we be... He broke off as a shrill whistle split the air. Bridge to Grand Admiral Thrawn, Lieutenant Shell's taut voice called over the intercom. Sir, we're under attack! Thrawn tapped the intercom switch. This is Thrawn, he said evenly. Go to Red Alert and tell me what we've got. Calmly, if possible. Yes, sir. The muted alert lights began flashing and Pelion could hear the sound of the klaxons baying faintly outside the room. 
Sensors are picking up four new Republic assault frigates, Shell continued, his voice tense, but under noticeably better control. Plus at least three wings of X-wing fighters, symmetric cloud V formation coming in on our scout ship's vector. Hellion swore under his breath. A single Star Destroyer with a largely inexperienced crew against four assault frigates and their accompanying fighters. Run engines to full power, he called towards the intercom. Prepare to make the jump to light speed. He took a step towards the door. Belay that jump order, Lieutenant, Thrawn said, still glacially calm. TIE fighter crews to their stations. Activate deflector shields. Hellion spun back to him. Admiral. Thrawn cut him off with an upraised hand. Come here, Captain, the Grand Admiral ordered. Let's take a look, shall we? He touched a switch, and abruptly the art show was gone. Instead, the room had become a miniature bridge monitor, with helm, engine, and weapon readouts on the walls in double display circle. The open space had become a holographic tactical display. In one corner, a flashing sphere indicated the invaders. The wall near display nearest it gave an ETA estimate of 12 minutes. Fortunately, the scout ships have enough of a lead not to be in danger themselves, Thrawn commented. So, let's see what exactly we're dealing with. Bridge. Order the three nearest sentry ships to attack. Yes, sir. Across the room, three blue dots shifted out of the sentry line onto intercept vectors. From the corner of his eye, Pelion saw Thrawn lean forward in his seat as the assault frigates and accompanying X-wings shifted in response. One of the blue dots winked out. Excellent, Thrawn said, leaning back in his seat. That will do, Lieutenant. Pull the other two sentry ships back and order the Sector 4 line to scramble out of the invader's vector. Yes, sir, Shell said, sounding more than a little confused. A confusion Pelion could well understand. Shouldn't we at least signal the rest of the fleet? He suggested, hearing the tightness in his voice. The Death's Head could be here in twenty minutes, most of the others in less than an hour. The last thing we want to do right now is bring in more of our ships, Captain, Thrawn said. He looked up at Pelion, and a faint smile touched his lips. After all, there may be survivors, and we wouldn't want the Rebellion learning about us, would we? He turned back to his displays. Bridge, I want a twenty-degree port yaw rotation. Bring us flat to the invader's vector, superstructure pointed at them. As soon as they're within the outer perimeter, the Sector 4 sentry line is to reform behind them and jam all transmissions. Yes, sir. Sir? You don't have to understand, Lieutenant, Thrawn said, his voice abruptly cold. Just obey. Yes, sir. Pelion took a careful breath as the, as the display showed the chimera rotating as per orders. I'm afraid I don't understand either, Admiral, he said, turning our superstructure towards them. Again, Thrawn stopped him with an upraised hand. Watch and learn, Captain. That's fine, Bridge. Stop rotation and hold position here. Drop docking bay deflector shields, boost power to all others. TIE fighter squadrons, launch when ready. Head directly away from the Chimera for two kilometers, then sweep around in open cluster formation. <clears throat> Backfire speed, zonal attack pattern. He got an acknowledgement, then looked up at Pelion. Do you understand now, Captain? Pelion pursed his lips. I'm afraid not, he admitted. I see now that the reason that you turned the ship was to give the fighters some exit cover, but the rest is nothing but a classic Marg Seibel closure maneuver. They're not going to fall for anything that simple. <clears throat> On the contrary, Thrawn corrected coolly. Not only will they fall for it, they'll be utterly destroyed by it. Watch, Captain, and learn. The TIE fighters launched accelerating away from the chimera and then leaning hard into etheric rudders to sweep back around it like the spray of some exotic fountain. The invading ships spotted the attackers and shifted vectors. Hellion blinked. What in the Empire are they doing? They're trying the only defense they know of against a Marg Sable, Thrawn said, and there was no mistaking the satisfaction in his voice. Or, to be more precise, the only defense they are psychologically capable of attempting. He nodded towards the flashing sphere. You see, Captain, there's an Elom commanding that force, 
and a lawman simply cannot handle the unstructured attack profile of a properly executed Marg Sable. Elian stared at the invaders, still shifting into their utterly useless defense stance, and slowly it dawned on him what Thrawn had just done. That sentry ship attack a few minutes ago, he said. You were able to tell from that that those were Elaman ships? Learn about art, Captain, Thrawn said, his voice almost dreamy. When you understand a species' art, you understand that species. He straightened in his chair. Bridge, bring us to flank speed. Prepare to join the attack. An hour later, it was all over. The ready room door slid shut behind the wing commander, and Pelion gazed back at the map still on the display. Sounds like a Broa sky is a dead end, he said regretfully. There's no way we'll be able to spare the manpower that much pacification would cost. For now, perhaps, Thrawn agreed. But only for now. Elian frowned across the table at him. Thrawn was fiddling with a data card, rubbing it absently between finger and thumb, as he stared out the viewport at the stars. A strange smile played about his lips. Admiral? he asked carefully. Thrawn turned his head, those glowing eyes coming to rest on Pelion. It's the second piece of the puzzle, Captain, he said softly, holding up the data card. The piece I've been searching for now for over a year. Abruptly, he turned to the intercom, jabbed it on. Bridge, this is Grand Admiral Thrawn. Signal the Death's Head. Inform Captain Harbid will be temporarily leaving the fleet. He's to continue making tactical surveys of the local systems and pulling data dumps wherever possible. Then set course for a planet called Mercur. The nav computer has its location. The bridge acknowledged, and Thrawn turned back to Pelion. You seem lost, Captain, he suggested. I take it you've never heard of Mercur. Pelion shook his head, trying without success to read the Grand Admiral's expression. Should I have? Probably not. Most of those who have have been smugglers, malcontents, and otherwise useless dregs of the galaxy. He paused, taking a measured sip from a mug at his elbow, a strong forvish ale from the smell of it, and Pelion forced himself to remain silent. Whatever the Grand Admiral was going to tell him, he was obviously going to tell it in his own way and time. I ran across an offhand reference to it some seven years ago, Thrawn continued, setting his mug back down. What caught my attention was the fact that, although the planet had been populated for at least three hundred years, both the Old Republic and the Jedi of that time had always left it strictly alone. He cocked one blue-black eyebrow slightly. What would you infer from that, Captain? Elian shrugged. That it's a frontier planet, somewhere too far away for anyone to care about. Very good, Captain. That was my first assumption, too. Except that it's not. Mercur is, in fact, no more than a hundred fifty light years from here, close to our border with the Rebellion and well within the Old Republic's boundaries. Thrawn dropped his eyes to the data card still in his hand. No, the actual explanation is far more interesting, and far more useful. Helian looked at the data card, too. And that explanation became the first piece of this puzzle of yours. Thrawn smiled at him. Again, Captain. Very good. Yes. Merker, or more precisely, one of its indigenous animals, was the first piece. The second is on a world called Wayland. He waved the data card. A world for which, thanks to the Abroans, I finally have a location. I congratulate you, Pelion said, suddenly tired of this game. May I ask just what exactly this puzzle is? Thrawn smiled, a smile that sent a shiver up Pelion's back. Why, the only puzzle worth solving, of course, the Grand Admiral said softly. The complete, total, and utter destruction of the Rebellion. And that's the end of the first chapter. I don't know if this kind of thing would be your guys' cup of tea, but I thought it might be fun to try it and see what you all think. Let me know. Let me know if you have any memories of reading the book originally or if this is your first time experiencing it. Talk to you all later. Hope you have a great weekend.